Good evening, everybody. Good evening, and uh, welcome to this event uh, being organised by the Foundation for Science and Technology. Uh, my name is Gavin Costigan. I'm the Chief Executive of the Foundation. I'm not David Willits, as you might have noticed. Um, so David is, is voting on important things in the House of Lords and will be cycling here on his Brompton bicycle um, and will seamlessly take over from me at some stage over the course of this evening. Um, but welcome to you all who are here in the Royal Society and welcome also to those people following us on Zoom. Um, so the title for today's event is Hard Tech and High Value Manufacturing. And uh, we are hugely grateful to three organisations for supporting our work and helping us put this on. That's the ERA Foundation, the Royal Academy of Engineering and Sterling Media. So thank you very much uh, for that. What are we doing here? What, what's the purpose? So what we're trying to uh, have is a, a bit of a conversation uh, and there are a number of questions that we could ask in this kind of post-COVID economic recovery period. So how important is the value, is high value manufacturing to the economy? How do those types of companies in that space work with the research base? How do they contribute to overall innovation strategies that governments are trying to pull together? What's their role in skills and skills development and levelling up? Um, and what should the policymakers in the room and watching online be doing, be thinking, to ensure that we really get value out of this hugely important sector? Now, we may not get round to all of those questions, um, but that's, uh, that's just a, a small selection to see if we can get uh, the conversation going. Um, so the sequence is that each of the speakers is going to come up and speak in turn for 10 to 12 minutes, uh, and then afterwards I'm going to ask them, or David is going to ask them, to uh, form a panel and we'll take questions at that time uh, and we'll take questions both from in the room and from online uh, and if you're following online please do put your questions as we always say in the Q&A function and not the chat function and then we will all see them feel free if you're watching online to upvote questions and that allows us to know which are the most interesting questions that you'd like to have uh, answered. If you want to tweet about the event, please do. We have a hashtag, which is hashtag FSTHVM. Um, but please just do tag us, and uh, let's see how the conversation goes. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, who is Peter Marsh. Uh, so Peter is the founder of Made Here Now, which is a website on UK manufacturing aimed at encouraging more young people to consider technology and production as a career. He's previously worked in the Financial Times, most recently as a manufacturing editor and at New Scientist. Um, in recent years, he's given talks on manufacturing opportunities in many countries, uh, and he is the author of The New Industrial Revolution, Consumers, Globalization, and the End of Mass Production. Peter, over to you. Okay. Well, th thank you very much for the introduction, and thanks very much, uh, Gavin and colleagues, for the uh, opportunity to speak today about the world of manufacturing, particularly what's going on in Britain. Um, I sh should say that um, I spent a long time at the Financial Times, had the chance to find out an awful lot about what was going on in global manufacturing, talking to about 3,000 companies making things all around the world. And um, from this, I suppose, in, it came out a number of things. That's really to explain how I'm here today. Um, now, I'm going to start straight away by talking about, a bit about hard tech, which is in the title. I'm just quickly going to say that hard tech, for, for those of you who stumble on the definition, simply means using technology, or often combinations of technologies, to make tangible products. In other words, uh, different to soft tech, soft tech is using also technology in an intensive way, but to make intangible things. So it's fairly easy when you think about it. This photo is a, a picture inside uh, what is one of the best examples of my definition, a hard tech company in Great Britain. This is Plessy Semiconductor down in, um, down in Plymouth. 
Um, I'm going to move on to a bit more about hard tech later on. That's the definitional point straight out of the way. I'm, I'm going to try and sketch out what is manufacturing, what are the different parts of it, why it's useful to have in an economy, and what, if anything, policymakers should be doing, as Gavin has mentioned. Now, at its most basic, um, manufacturing is about adding value to materials. It's really no more complicated than that. Um, now, this table, which chemists will know about, is you know, one of the world's most important documents, really. It tells you about the periodic table of the elements. From this, you can see there's only really 100 basic materials that uh, people have to work with, if you leave out the ones that are quite hard to get out of the elements. Now, there's 100 things from which the world's manufacturers, uh, every year, they, they make something like 10 billion different things every year that are vital to just about every part of life. If you're wondering where the 10 billion fear comes from, that's something I worked out a few years ago. Now, this is all done by really quite a small number of people. Uh, we're used in Britain to thinking, oh, well, don't have many people working in manufacturing. Um, but in fact, it's true this all around the world. World manufacturing employment is only about 350 million people around the world, something like 10% 10, 10 of the available workforce. Now, I mean, we're all used to, again, pictures of people in China. Obviously, there are loads of people making things in China, but again, it's, it's not a big part of the working population. If anything, it's going down. Over the whole world, something like 15% of total GDP is accounted for by manufacturing. Now, it's only about 10% in the United Kingdom, as we know, getting off for 20% in other countries. But nowhere is it a huge part of the economy it measured as measured conventionally. So that's something to get hold of. So Britain isn't such an outlier as some people think. Now, doing manufacturing on the whole is quite hard. That's one thing to be interested in from an economic point of view. The people working in manufacturing generally need quite high levels of skills. The sector is a big user of technology, um, accounting for perhaps nearly half total R&D in the United Kingdom. Um, so, and again, it requires higher levels of capital. Now, th this is just a way to explain, really, from an economic point of view, that if you put more into anything, more energy, uh, uh, ideas, you're going to get more out of it, and the same goes for manufacturing. So productivity in manufacturing is quite high, 10%, 20% more than many services, and as you'd expect for a sector employing relatively large numbers of skilled people, people get more, more money, wages 10% higher, probably than much of the rest of the economy. So this explains why manufacturing really should be quite near the, list of, near the top of the list of things. People in the UK, politicians and so on, are interested in encouraging. Now, it's not always... Um, is it? And so behind this, I think we need to work out why that is. One of the reasons, I think, is something to do with history. Uh, Britain's got a very long involvement with manufacturing. It was the first real industrial country uh, where the original industrial revolution happened. And for a brief period, only about 50 years, actually, quite a short time, it became the world's biggest manufacturing nation, accounting for about 20% of total manufacturing output in 1895, according to the best figures you can get hold of. Uh, before that, oddly enough, China was the biggest. But then after that, uh, its position weakened. As recently as the 50s, um, it was still, though, in the pretty high up the league table, accounted for 10% of total manufacturing output. And we have factories like this nice plant in uh, Dagenham, which, again, many are familiar with, which, which were still quite big factories. People could know about them. Seven or eight million people worked in manufacturing back then, um, as opposed to two and a half million now. So now the United Kingdom is number nine in the world league table. Uh, not too bad, it doesn't sound, but 
position falls to about number 26 if you think about manufacturing output per person. So this is, paints a sort of mixed picture of manufacturing in the United Kingdom. We had a feeling of national decline. There's a feeling Britain used to be much better at it, didn't they? Um, or didn't we? Um, there's a general feeling of negativity about the country at the moment. Uh, Brexit might be one reason behind that, I suppose. Um, and, but there's still the feeling of nostalgia about the time when Britain was number one. You can't escape Britain's industrial history. It's around everywhere, even as you walk through the streets of most cities. Um, so on one level, there's a feeling it would be good if Britain could get back into the higher position of manufacturing. Same time, a doubt that we could do it. Now, there's also one very negative point. Many people think of manufacturing as dirty, old-fashioned, uh, really rather polluting, and uh, that's one reason why people think, well, it doesn't really matter if we don't do much of it. But from an economic point of view, as I said, it's quite important to have. One of the problems about getting all this over to the conventional politician or the person in the street is the difficulty in understanding what modern manufacturing is. In the past, it was much easier to see big factories like this one. Uh, it wasn't too hard to spot them. You'd walk around and you'd often smell them before you saw them. Uh, making steel, cars, ships, everyone could understand. Today, the average um, or the typical manufacturing employer is much smaller, maybe employing 100 people on, in a little building on the edge of the town. Uh, and it's making in many cases, obscure components that even the people working in these companies struggle to explain to the ordinary person. So all this explains, I think, why the drive to explain what this 21st century manufacturing is and why it's important is, I think, very much needed. Now let's move on to this thing about the separating the different parts. Um, sales of all manufactured goods in 2021 in Britain came to about 400 billion. Uh, that's total sales. That's not the same as GD, not the same as value added, which is a bit lower. Now, of, of the total, 60% of this 400 billion was what I'd call standard industrial products, involving and requiring a, a fairly modest amount of um, technology, uh, often not particularly huge. Th this is sectors like, like food, uh, a lot of te uh, textiles, quite a bit of basic building products. Often the products of this sector uh, are pretty much consumed inside the country. They're not exported very much. Now, the remaining 40% under the definitions I would urge you to adopt and use um, is hard tech. The sectors covered in this are fairly broad. Many individual industries, parts of chemicals, industrial and scientific instruments, machines, etc. Um, now, perhaps half of this amount, which I call hard tech, would be construed as advanced manufacturing or high tech that we more we, 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 we're more used to grappling with as a term. Now, this normally people use to, to mean things like electronics, biotech, and so on. But I, I think that the word hard tech is a much more useful concept to take on. One reason for this is that there are some excellent companies who I'd call hard tech companies who wouldn't fall within this definition of so-called high tech or, um, or, or, or the advanced manufacturing. They'd fall outside it. And um, therefore, they, these are good companies, people, companies that you want to see in Britain because they employ people, they're doing rather well yet they just fall outside this definition. There's a few examples. I mean, Renishaw, which is, is this one here, is one of the best ones, employs 3,000 people in Britain. I mean, there's quite a few others, um, one of which is um, Brompton Bicycle, which um, you're going to hear about a bit more in a bit. Um, an another one is this nice company in, in Cumbria is a picture of some of the people working there. It's, and they, most people wouldn't even have heard of this company called James Walker, who employs 2,000 people around the world, half of them in Great Britain, making specialist seals for um, things like wind, wind turbines, using all sorts of 
um, skills and, and technologies. Now, I, I should end with just one thing about knitting together a lot of these the technologies in these companies is IT. IT and automation, uh, the idea of the fourth industrial revolution is all very important. But the main reason these companies are good and could do better and are worth having is because of what they're doing in other areas, not IT. Uh, why I think the term, the fourth industrial revolution, is bandied about a little bit too much and uh, not quite so relevant to really understanding what's going on. I'm going to end really, I mean, I, policy makers, my advice to them is really to understand the sector, to, to sort of promulgate what it is all about, and then maybe think about schemes that can help them um, in whatever way makes most sense. But I'll leave other people to consider that. And so that's my introduction. So hopefully that's got everything going in a reasonable way. Thank you very much. Thanks, Peter. That's, uh, that's wonderful. So our second speaker this evening is Will Butler-Adams. Will is Chief Executive Officer of Brompton, as described already by Peter. Uh, that's a company he joined in 2002, became a director in 2006, and took over as CEO in 2008. Uh, and the company has grown quite a lot whilst he's uh, been in charge of it. Uh, he's a chartered engineer and passionate about all things engineering, was awarded an OBE in 2015 for services to industry. Will, over to you. Thank you, everybody. Um, I'm going to start my stopwatch, because I tend to go on. Um, so I had a little think about what I was going to talk about, and I'm not really going to talk about flogging you one of our bikes, which obviously I like to try and do, but on this rare occasion, I'm going to try and steer away from that. And um, the remit was to try and think about what we need to do to funk up making stuff because we're not making enough. And um, so my starting position is, um, I think, I can't remember which politician it was, maybe it was Tony Blair, who said, education, education, education. That is our problem, in my humble opinion, with the industry. And, and, and there is a perception that... Um, it's all high-tech. It's that semiconductor company that Peter had. That's what we have to do. Nanotechnology, graphene, you know, cutting edge, zooming off to space. But here we are, um, a bicycle company manufacturing in London, which is hardly the epicentre of the world's cheap labour. Um, and we're making a bicycle, which of course isn't high-tech, is it? because it's a bicycle, and um, we're selling this thing to the Chinese. In fact, China's about to take off and become our largest export market. Well, clearly, we're weird. We've got it wrong. We should be mating nano nimby nimby wimbies, <laughs> not bicycles, which are simple things with two wheels. But that's where the education bit comes in. And that's where we come in as an enthusiastic bunch who are all terribly knowledgeable. Our politicians do not understand our sector. Universities are not delivering to our sector and the dear old parents who are busily encouraging their children to be the best things since sliced bread haven't got a scooby-doo. So let's start with the politicians. They need to understand and be educated by us. You can produce, and I thought Peter was going to come up with it because he told me this about 15 years ago, and it's flipping genius. I can't remember the name of the company, but they make fittings for your bathroom. If you go to Screwfix or somewhere, you'll find a fitting, a plastic fitting, costs 60 pence, and you, you know, when your U bend's gone on your on your plumbing, you have to unscrew it and stick another one on. John Gaskell. Could be. Yeah, there they are. 
They're all nodding. Made in the UK, cheap as chips, nothing high value about that. No, there's nothing high value about that. But you have a look at the kit that they use to make it. It's off the flipping chart. It's insane. It's pumping things out so fast. And you can't ship them from China because they're so damn cheap. And it's mostly air. It doesn't make commercial sense. That is smart. That's high tech. But the politicians cannot see it. We make a bike. This bike is made in Sheffield. I don't want to bore you, because obviously, if you haven't got one, you bloody well need one. <laughs> but this is awesome. We've used computers that are just breathtakingly powerful to do FEA on this. We're using cobots and robots. We're using MIM. We're using awesome stuff just to make a bicycle. So it's deeper and a bit more sophisticated than we realise. To run our factory, we have Raspberry Pis all over it. We write our own software in Python. We're trying to create a fully integrated company that when somebody, you know, in America, some celeb rides our bike and suddenly like, everybody's getting excited online with, they want to look at that bike. And we know that the funnel from the top to the bottom is a 2% transition. And suddenly, because somebody rode our bike in America, in Hollywood, everybody's getting excited about that product. Well, we hadn't bought for that, because that wasn't part of the plan. So within 10 days, we completely reconfigure our supply chain to change what we thought we were buying, knowing that in three weeks' time, the Yanks are all going to start buying that bike. That is smart. And that is value that we have in the UK, a fully integrated, sophisticated business not just the product at the end. It's everything in between that we need to bring together and we can do very effectively in the UK because we have a multifaceted research, university, collaboration and sort of slightly quirky group of human beings in our country. And we can massively optimise that. So then you come on to universities. I went to university... I had four years. I had one year in the, in the middle where I went off to Spain and had an absolute riot. The other three years, I did mechanical engineering in Spanish. The Spanish bit was brilliant. The engineering bit was, oh, God, it was horrendous. It was like three years of how to put you off the career. It was awful. The university lecturers, you know, they came out. They simply were not interested in students. They produced laminates and put them on the projector, and they were still 10 years old, and they did the Carnot cycle in the same way they'd done it 10 years ago. We had one bloke who'd actually worked in any sort of real company. The rest of them were just sort of interested in trying to produce papers. They were just interested in just producing you know, publishing papers with some completely irrelevant stuff. They weren't interested in us. And I would say they've improved, but I think they have a long way to go. Universities need to inspire. They need to excite. They need to bring alive what an awesome career it is. And they are not doing that because they're not measured on that. The university lecture is not measured on the outcome of the student. They're measured on how many weird little, never heard of it, totally irrelevant research they've done. Bits okay of research work, but there isn't enough focus on the student, on inspiring the next generation to come into our industry. So they do engineering to go and work in banking or to go and become some consultant. And, you know, they're not going into an awesome industry. But I, was, I, I, I had such a painful time at university, I thought, oh, I'm just going to get on and get chartered because I felt I'd sort of killed myself to get through the degree. And then I discovered this world of milk and honey, and it was a complete adrenaline rush and really exciting and fascinating and brilliant. But you wouldn't have had a clue at university. Let's go back another step. Parents. There is an advert. I was, on, I was watching it last night on the telly. BT. You know, diddy, 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 here we are to solve your problems. You've got a leak, you've got a, you know, cost of living crisis. Don't worry, here are our engineers to sort you out. Diddy, 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 boop. Well, they're not engineers. They're plumbers. But BT, they're spending hundreds of thousands of pounds telling every parent that's sitting there watching telly, oh, 
I don't want my children being one of those, those engineers. They're one, and there's a, guess what? There's a monkey wrench in there. Yes, that's it. On their knees, monkey wrench. That's what engineers do. That is not on. And we've danced around that subject for too long. And if we're serious about reinvigorating, making, you need engineers to make materials, manufacturing, design, FEA, but they are engineers. They are not mechanics that fix your tire. They're not plumbers. They're not technicians. They are engineers that went through a three-year you know, baptism of fire to get to a point where they have a deep understanding of their subject matter. And that has to be dealt with. And we're not... My stopwatch, have I gone on a bit too far? No, I'm only eight minutes. We, we, we are not taking that seriously. And we've got all these societies and the Institute of this and the Institute of that, and they've got to pull themselves together and get on with it and sort these flipping politicians out and sort out. I had this brilliant idea. I never got through with it because I was making a bit of progress with David Cameron, and then he buggered off. Uh, but the idea was that we get BT, Dino Rod, you know, any of the British gas, any of these people, and we get the CEO who's today's CEO. They'll all be gone in five years' time because they come in for a job and then they all disappear. But you get them in for a good old knees up in number 10, whoever's in there, and we say to them, look, we want you to sign up to this voluntary code of conduct. Voluntary. And it hasn't got to be done for five years, by which time they all know they're not going to be in a job anymore because somebody else will have taken over. So they're happy to sign up to it. Voluntary. And they say they will, over the next five years, change the engineer that's fixing your tyre to a mechanic. The engineer that's fixing your heating to a plumber. Or whatever the correct nomenclature is. At least moving us towards a place where we're not just bombarded with incorrect information about our sector. So, in conclusion, there is so much for us to do. There is opportunity everywhere. We're riddled in it. We are working at Brompton. I've got a piece of paper somewhere in my pocket here. Here we go, because I mean, one of my team sent me this last night. Very good of him. We're doing mentoring of master's projects at Cranfield and Imperial. I do a, bit, a little bit of lecturing at Imperial. We've got, we're working with these fantastic catapults, which I think are great. We're working with the Blooming National Composite Centre, the Advanced Forming Research Centre, the Warwick Manufacturing Group. We're working with the Welding Institute, the Aluminium Federation, the National Physics Laboratory. And then we've got commercial partners in Fluxus, Cambridge Design Partnership. The point is, I mean, there's just tons of it. There's tons of it. We're all, it's there. We just need to go out and grab it and stop dancing around and be a bit more ambitious. And it's, yeah, it's all within the grasp. So for me, I, I don't really know who I'm talking to. Obviously, I know who I'm talking to here, but we, 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 I've been in this industry 20 years and I've failed systematically to, to move the dial for the UK PLC. We have done a lot with a bicycle against the odds. And it's not luck. Anyone can do it. It's ambition and determination. You apply that nationally, we can smash it out of the park. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. And uh, one of the first times we've had real props at uh, one of these events, which is brilliant. Um, our third speaker is Catherine Bennett. Uh, Catherine joined the High Value Manufacturing Catapult as Chief Executive in 2021 after 16 years in Airbus, where she was a Senior Vice President uh, with a number of different responsibilities, a number of different things, including the uh, ventilator challenge, which I might have a chat about you later. That's, that sounds great. Um, previous, previous to Airbus, a number of different uh, roles um, in Vauxhall Motors and, uh, and various things. Uh, and Catherine was awarded an OBE in 2019 and has an honorary doctorate from Cranfield. Catherine, over to you.
So does anyone else fancy following Will? <laughs> uh, I'll do my best. Um, Will, all I can say is I hope when you lecture at Imperial College, you're more dynamic than the le you lectures you told us about. Um, so tonight is, of course, Burns Night. So before coming here, I thought, let's Google and see if Rabbi Burns said anything about innovation. Of course, he didn't. But what did come up on my Google search was, of course, a reminder about the things that are great in Scotland. So obviously medicine, engineering and science. So I thought I need to give a, a bit of a shout out for that. But thank you also to the foundation, to Gavin, for setting this up and to the sponsors, which I know is really significant in all, all of this kind of debate to continue happening. So a few words, if I may, about the High Value Manufacturing Catapult. I'm delighted to be speaking at an event that's actually got the words High Value Manufacturing in it, because it's not always something that's talked about. So we are seven centres of innovation, which were founded just over 10 years ago and uh, funded through Innovate UK. So the purpose of our catapult, and I was pleased to hear that Will's team work with many of our centres, I did know that, but the whole point is to de-risk innovation, to get people to be more courageous, to be more bold, to work in partnership together and to collaborate and learn. So we endeavour to help companies transform their performance and move products and processes to market. Let's get, get things going. So key for me is what our teams, we have three and a half thousand people across the UK at 25 sites, is to focus on industrial foresighting. What are the manufacturers coming down the, the line? Who do we need to focus on? What are the sectors? What are the products and processes that we need to keep track on? And another part of that is workforce development. So keeping um, the skills updated and all importantly, encouraging all forms of people to come into the industry. And if people are inspired by that BT advert will to become engineers, let's get them in and let's help them learn about the opportunities in engineering. And those of you who know me well will know that I've also campaigned long and hard on increasing diversity in, in the engineering and manufacturing sectors. So my catapult, we deal with many, many sectors, uh, nuclear to pharma, energy to construction, automotive to aerospace, work with organizations such as the Faraday Challenge, work on projects such as lightweight materials, medical tech, vaccines development, of course, and composites. Uh, many of you know about our composite center down in Bristol. And let's get some proud, proud facts and figures out there. We're the Europe's largest advanced manufacturing capability. Uh, we've, over the years since we've been in existence, we've supported 22,000 companies, and over half of those people, those organisations, were SMEs, which is what we often get measured on too. So we are all about bridging the gap between UK universities and industry. Several of our centres are affiliated with universities, and I think some of them are in the room today. And one of the things we also pride ourselves on is our convening power. And I think Edmund might talk about this, but critical minerals is a, a big topic that the government's very focused on and we, we want to work on uh, a collaboration on that. Um, as Peter said, uh, lots of people have different views about what the word hard tech means. And I have to say, I somewhat scratch my head a bit. Um, and my solution was it's the application of engineering and science involved in the combination of hardware and software to solve a problem. So a little bit aligned to what Peter said. Um, but of course, that problem might be a particular industry issue or the need to solve a particular challenge. And perhaps what I'm just going to quickly focus on is climate change, net zero challenges. Obviously, here we are now, beginning of 2023, a uh, global pandemic and the European war continues to impact many of our industry sectors. Um, there's so many things that are coming down the line hitting our industry, but of course climate change is absolutely there and it's something that we need to be focusing on. And the red thread running through maybe some of those challenges I've just listed there is the power of high value manufacturing and trying to get sort of solutions and move things in the right direction, strengthening our national resilience, which I think is a key thing that perhaps we ought to talk about more against future shocks that might hit the industry. And of course, leveling up, getting um, focus across all, our, all of the UK. Uh, Peter mentioned some of the statistics about uh, manufacturing in the UK. So we uh, understand we're 
worth around 180 billion a year, with the average wage being 12% higher than the economy as a whole. So maybe we all ought to put our shoulder to the wheel to get that increased, as, as, as was just said. Um, I talked about bridging the gap. So how, can, how do we do that? So we focus on creating, commercialization, scaling up more low carbon and sustainable options for industry, and trying to work with our partners to put us at the forefront of this potential market for the UK. Find better ways, for example, of measuring and reporting environmental input across the whole product life cycle. And we need both sides of that solution. And the equation that we're looking to solve is to make progress against those goals that we've got on climate change. But deep collaboration doesn't just strengthen climate action and supply chain stability in the UK. It makes it possible to coordinate performance improvements and policy decisions for entire sectors in geographic regions. And those of you who are in small business know that it's always the bottom line. So we have to demonstrate how measuring your emissions can actually help improve your business certainly makes us a magnet for inward investment from international companies who are looking perhaps for simple, easier ways to reduce and report their life cycle impact. And it leverages that global market to create long-term jobs. So we're doing a lot of work on this and be happy to talk to some of you afterwards. And this is why initiatives such as this debate here tonight and Peter's Made Here Now initiative and the Foundation's Future Leaders Programme is important to get people all involved in this. I mean, let's just give a couple of examples of projects that are very, very live at the moment. The steel industry, the future of the steel industry, a big discussion. Sustainable steel, this affects so many sectors and the Manufacturing Technology Centre in Coventry is doing a lot of work with the construction sector, of course, a big user of the steel industry, working with experts in composites and additive manufacturing to try and help the steel industry improve their, their situation. Now, I've only been at the Catapult for about 19 months, but I've, I've seen incredibly impressive results when we bring the right people together. And Gavin was kind enough to mention the ventilator challenge, and I, I am going to give it a shout out. It, my predecessor, Dick Elsey, led, led this project, but it was incredible how aerospace and automotive companies came together in the space of a very short period of time to build 13,000 ventilators in just 12 weeks. It was incredible stories. When I was at Airbus, the people who are so devoted and dedicated to doing that project, and I think it needs writing about some more. I think I've bored you about this before, Gavin, haven't I? So just yesterday, I was at the National Physical Laboratory in Teddington, and aside from my excitement as a non-engineer at seeing around some of their labs, I saw the work they're doing on the optical clock, um, we had a great discussion about closer collaboration. So the NPL in Teddington, a great national asset, which I don't think is shouted about enough. And a product that I saw there and heard about there was a product called Optimum, where they're working with one of my centres at uh, AMRC in North Wales, with my former employer, Airbus, a, a new way of measuring and self-calibrating, coordinating measurement systems. And, and apparently, it's really working well. And as a result of actually two people who just knew each other got together in a room and found a solution. Mention has been made of offshore wind. Again, another opportunity that I think many of our centres want to work with industry on. I spoke at an event with the offshore industry recently. And there's so much more that can be done on helping to um, develop and design more um, environmentally friendly um, aspects of the sustainable blades, etc., for the offshore wind industry. And I'm just going to end by talking about high value design. This is a project that is it's, it's an it's this expertise that we have across the UK that, again, isn't shouted out enough about. When I worked in aerospace, the people I worked alongside in Bristol, they spend their life trying to design more environmentally friendly wings and helping with reducing the fuel burn. They, the design was their absolute laser focused. And since I've been in the job at the High Value Manufacturing Catapult, I've been incredibly impressed by the dedication of the people who really want to help improve this nation. And actually, as Will said, there is so much potential that we can just do it by working close together. Thank you.
Thanks so much, Catherine. Um, so our fourth speaker today is Edmund Ward, uh, who comes from Bayes, the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, uh, where he's the head of advanced, I can't say that, the head of advanced manufacturing and resources. Um, he's been working with industry for uh, quite some time uh, and has been involved uh, in the critical mineral strategy, which indeed is quite relevant, interesting to a number of the things we're talking about today. Um, his current portfolio uh, includes convening expertise to understand the future of manufacturing technologies, including considering how to harness the opportunities that these can bring. Edmund, over to you. Well, thanks so much, Gavin. It's great to be here. Thanks also to the sponsors and, you know, genuinely passionate to sort of talk to a forum, you know, which is which is bringing together as, as the uh, Foundation for Science and Technology and the Royal Society are sort of stimulating the debate, bringing together innovators, scientists, technologists, engineers, um, and, and uh, policy makers, um, some of whom, like me, maybe a bit best described as, as a lapsed engineer. I did material science and engineering, so I don't know whether that makes me an engineer, a scientist, or neither, but... Uh, there we go. Um, uh, look, in, in terms of, I hope you'll indulge me, a shorter introduction, which is um, I, I moved house in September. Um, and while I'm still doing the same role, so I'm still leading on the kind of delivery of, of government's manufacturing sort of programs and strategy, I'm now based in Darlington, uh, the Darlington Economic Campus, um, alongside colleagues from, from the Treasury and others. Um, so I, I hope that sort of is part of the sort of government's wider commitment to manufacturing, which of course is not just something that happens in Whitehall and government does, does get that. Um, uh, and I think leveling up in action, I guess, also trying to join up between departments. Again, this isn't something that any one department in and its own, you know, manufacturing is a significant enough issue that we need a, a whole government approach. And I think that's that's the kind of thing that we're, that we're trying to drive. Um, as I um, as I moved uh, up north, I did leave behind two apple trees uh, that we planted in the house we lived in when I was commuting to Westminster when my son was born. Now, I don't want you to feel too sorry for me because I did get four in the new house I moved to, so I don't know what that says, either about inflation or about the north-south divide. Um, but anyway, I want to talk about apple trees as, as a way to illustrate the kind of the innovation ecosystem and, um, and, and what innovation I think is at the heart of supporting not just current manufacturing but the next generation of, of manufacturing technologies and the next generation of, of workers that will, that will do that and the next generation of, of people that will benefit from that. Uh, this, this, the chart in the middle is, is, the, is the, the slightly dry sort of innovation uh, sort of ecosystem chart in the, in the government's innovation strategy, which is really important. Um, and I think if you think ab about what you need, and, and, and first of all, think about what we're trying to get to, what are the outcome here? We want, we want growth, we want jobs, we want health, we want societal welfare. We've got some significant goals, which are worth the effort. How do we get to that innovation system? We need, uh, we need to start from seeds, and now some of that seed is, is ideas, it's technical, we need the technology, we need the ideas, but also we need to seed the money. These things are risky, some of them work and some of them don't. Uh, so we need venture capital, we need small firms, we need startups, we need those mentalities, we need those ideas, uh, and we need a, an ecosystem that supports those. We need the research and technology organizations that bring together people from different sectors or subsectors because together that's how you tackle these hard challenges that won't be tackled by their own. Uh, and some of those small companies in and of themselves will make a big difference to a big challenge. And some of them won't, and, but they will make a small difference and, uh, and they will get bigger and they will grow and they will scale up. And then you get large firms who are making an even bigger impact on a, on a bigger scale. Um, and that kind of what they are doing, if that's the processing, if that's the processing of the apples, you know, is but whatever, whatever it is, we've taken um, a, some seeds, we've sowed them, we've got a, a range of trees. And, and, and what, what our university sector, for example, is doing is... Uh, is fostering these ideas. We invest in, in innovation, we invest in science and research, knowing that not everything will turn immediately into an apple, the thing that we can process and then solve our problem. But we know that some of them will, and that's important too. And what's government's role here? Well, we are, um, we're, we're, providing, we're providing the enabling environment. We're, we're, the, we're the watering can. We're the people that, that, that keeps the system working, or it should, if we get it right. And sometimes governments do, and sometimes they don't. And when we don't, we need, to, we need to improve. And I'm here not representing the whole of government or all of policymakers, but I'm here definitely to represent what we're doing within Bayes and the advanced manufacturing sector and really keen to talk to, to you and, and understand where we're doing well and, and where we're not. Um, 
where is the UK now? We, we definitely have some UK strengths and opportunities, again, and uh, to, to earlier points. I think we shouldn't talk down what we have in the UK in terms of a manufacturing sector, which has some real, real strengths. Um, we've got the talent and development to support innovation. We've got four of the top 10 universities in the world. We are really good at attracting not just homegrown R&D, but attracting in R&D from international investors. And we have, you know, we have support through our R&D tax program, a number of other things that will do that. Um, the UK is Europe's leading nation for venture capital. Um, and almost all of that goes into small companies with fewer than 50 employees. Uh, and again, not all of those go on to, to, to change the world, but some of them do. And those that don't uh, may seed the next venture capital funded startup that two years later will. So having that ecosystem again is really important. Um, and a lot of that is in sort of some fairly concentrated sectors, things like UK sort of quantum technology startups is a particular area of interest. Uh, and we've got more than 25% of the, the unicorns, kind of $1 billion capitalizations um, ac across, uh, across Europe, more than France and Germany combined. Um, and we, we are investing in growth and knowledge transfer. So um, we are, our R&D uh, is increasing, continues to grow, and that is the, what we need to do, and the, the government is committed to continuing to support that from a uh, government investment perspective, but also, again, having the ecosystem is so important to get that. Uh, get that right in, in, in the world because it is it's companies that are that are funding the bulk of that, not not the government. Um, we've got uh, IP is important again. Question to the role to which you know to get that IP regime right to maximise innovation, uh, and also sort of taking the fruits of that R and D or that development and turning uh, or uh, into kind of innovation and companies that that make a difference. Uh, we've got two spin-outs per 100 million pounds of research income, which compares favorably with the US. So I think it's important to just recognize we're not starting from nothing when we talk about how do we take what we have now and, and grow it and make it even better. Um, now, I think uh, we've, got, we've got definitions of, of, deep, of deep tech or hard tech and, and what do they mean. I think if I, if I define it for this as, as kind of those problems which are hard enough that you need to take a risk on them, they need to be de-risked, they need to have uh, a, a, a sort of a technical challenge resulting in a sort of a material outcome, uh, and they're tackling something which is important enough that it's worth the risk. Um, we've got deep, deep tech examples who are doing things like really, who are you know, turning carbon dioxide into plastics uh, or developing you know, Thermulon novel high-performance non-combustible non insulation foam, which we all appreciate you know, the value of that. And we're seeing sort of private sector investments in sort of uh, sort of con continuum sort of last year in terms of you know quantum quantum investments, significant amounts of money. Uh, the UK Life Sciences Fund that now you know has got external uh, sovereign wealth funds sort of supporting um, UK life science investment. Um, so I've given some some examples there in, in a range of sectors, but let's move on to another big challenge, which we all know, uh, which is net zero. Uh, with government is definitely seized of the challenge, as is industry and society. Uh, and as the recent uh, Skidmore review uh, sets out, um, we're also very alive to the op opportunity costs that there is. Uh, you know, net zero is better than not zero. Green tape is better than red tape. Um, if you haven't read the report, definitely, definitely do. Um, so we've we've done a lot on as government to kind of set out the parameters. But where do we where do we where do we go next? Um, I think. We recognize that there are different elements of decarbonization. Uh, we talked earlier, or others, others have, about it, the value. We're not just trying to look at the products, but also the processes. We need both of those to work. The energy system needs to work as well. These are not problems that you solve in isolation, but these are big challenges, and with big challenge, challenges come big opportunities. And if you get this right, uh, there are big opportunities in sort of the deep tech or the high value manufacturing for things that will make us more resource efficient and more energy efficient, that will enable us to switch to different fuel systems, uh, and that will, will work on our sort of reduction of, of carbon generation as well. Um, I, I've talked already about the innovation strategy, but again, to give it the credit on the left, that's, that's where it comes from. Again, uh, leading the future by creating it is the tagline for that. 
what follows from that, though, is a series of, of other documents. So the government working on our UK quantum strategy as well, and other sort of seven technology families identified in the innovation strategy. I think there's a role for manufacturing in all of the, one of those is about manufacturing. There are seven. There's a role for manufacturing in all of those, and those are all areas which are important and which uh, have have scope to be uh, to be to be worked on. Uh, we've done a call for evidence on that, and, and a quantum strategy will follow. Uh, we, we are working on a, an investment prospectus, again, to, to the point about really being able to talk positively about manufacturing is really important. Uh, showcasing some of, the, some of the brilliant and innovative things that UK companies are doing, uh, UK manufacturers are doing, uh, and showing how government is going to work hand in hand with that, I think, is really important. Um, we've got uh, that take the, to take the kind of the risk spectrum to, to the extreme, you get to the, to the Advanced Research and Invention Agency, uh, they'll pick some real sort of winners uh, or not. And again, uh, giving a part of government the space to not be bound by the normal ministerial requirements around sort of wanting to, you know, having to, to answer to Parliament on every decision uh, directly and giving that flexibility, I think, is important. Uh, there's a large number of, of, of bits of infrastructure that the government has, and I, I won't list them all. Obviously, the catapults we've, we've heard about from Catherine. Uh, and, and more than half of the catapult network is, is, is the high value, value manufacturing catapults, which hopefully sort of signals where we do see that as a real, you know, manufacturing is, is really important. Um, I think uh, we've got um, institutes, we've got companies that work between sectors, we've got sectoral sort of, so advanced propulsion center, aerospace technology, but also increasingly sort of in, in, interventions which look across sectors because that's where we're gonna see the you know, the problems being solved, we, we're going to see sort of integration, we're going to see uh, sort of the direction is ab about bringing together, collaborating across sectors, across boundaries, and I think that's where we, where, where we see the next generation uh, of innovations will come from. Um, so I've talked a bit about, uh, about the wider system. I just want to give a few sort of quick uh, examples of, um, concrete examples of, of, of what government and industry working together are doing. So zero emission aviation, and again, a big and grand goal. Uh, government provided some, some, some research funding to look at the different technologies for, for, uh, for zero emission aviation. Um, there's a question about the extent to which it will be sustainable aviation fuels versus a range of other things. Uh, but you, you know, we've seen now government uh, and industry working together saying, look, we thought that you would never get uh, a zero emission flight, and we've seen, you know, We've now seen sustainable aviation flights, you know, going across across the Atlantic, and we've seen the concept aircraft that will take batteries, or will take hydrogen, or will take hydrogen combustion, and will actually get that to work. So we're we're seeing real progress there. Um, in the automotive sector, I mean, uh, Peter shared a, a, a picture of a Ford factory, uh, and in, in in black and white, what does what does the colour version look like today? Um, we've got, uh, you know. Uh, Ford, you know, recently announced that it's it's e drive. So you know, what replaced the engines is you know electronic, is electric drives, motors, you know, uh, that will sort of power the next generation of zero emission vehicles, um, and that's what they're going to generate for Europe in their Halewood Merseyside site. Um, how did they get there, though? How do we get that innovation and that and that investment? Well, it's about a lot of that is about the the journey to get there is through. Uh, the processes and getting the, the, the design right, digital twins, get the manufacturing strategy right for the company, uh, working on how uh, to, the, to the sort of millions of very simple parts flying through a, a process very well is not straightforward, but if you get that right, the, 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 the dividends are there. Um, and again, process, not just product, made smarter, is one of the, again, a, a, a big push, both in terms of investment uh, in uh, in uh, manufacturing technologies, um, there are sort of five pilot regions now around the UK where companies are getting access to not just about understanding what technology is out there, but it's it's actually adoption of these manufacturing technologies. However many process innovations we make, if companies don't understand that they're out there or understand how to get them or can get the sort of the, the help to actually deploy these technologies, they won't help. Uh, I, I don't like to ever come and do a talk and not sort of say where there's some mon money available too. So, you know, there's a funding competition on Made Smarter at the moment on industry-ready robotics and automation. You know, so that's just one of many examples that you can find on the Innovate UK site for, you know, where, where there's opportunities to sort of, for, 
government funding to de-risk some of these, these things which are really needed. Um, I talked about the kind of the environment point and what's government's role here, and I think definitely part of government's role is creating the enabling environment, and part of that is just being really clear. What's our demand? What is uh, the likely supply? What are the sources? What are industry all collectively saying to us, and how can we share that? Sometimes these things are clear, and sometimes they're not. Batteries, we know the demand is going to go up. I'm not going to talk a lot about the critical minerals, but we, we published a strategy on that last year, which I think really put the government's sort of commitment behind, look, we've set out very high ambition on things like electric vehicles. We know that's going to drive demand, but this is specifically where we see that is going to impact on the supply chain. So this is where you need to, uh, to look if you're an investor or if you're a, a supply chain company or you're an OEM. This is how to think about it. And again, as, as government, we set those demand signals and then uh, we need to work also on the supply side and with, with innovators to make sure that everyone has the opportunity to tackle those opportunities. So in, in summing up, what would I say? I think the UK is definitely a great place to, to innovate, to invest, to manufacture, um, and, uh, it, but it's not perfect and, and nobody will, will say that. Um, as how do you take that forward and how do you engage with policymakers on this? I think one of the important things is to really be clear about what your priority is. My experience in getting government in initiatives over the line has been if, if everybody in the industry all agrees on one thing that will really make a difference and they all say it, then more than half of the time, it, well, every time, but more than half of the time, that will, that will kind of turn the dial, build the case for that, inform it with evidence. Um, I think government's role as well is, is building in, 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 and really selling the reputation of this sector and the skills are an absolutely massive, massive part of that. The image, where do skills come from? They come from great people doing it and where do great people come from? They, they need to want to do it. So the image of the, of the sector uh, is really important and getting that innovation right. Um, so keep doing what you're doing, those of you that are in this space, collaborate with others, uh, whether you're a seed, a tree, an apple, or uh, the processor, the manufacturer, then uh, please keep, keep doing what we're doing and talk to us about how it can be even better. Thank you. Yes, I have just had a, a, another message from uh, uh, from David Willits. The voting is continuing, is the message. So uh, we're going to carry on, and uh, now we're going to move to the question and answer session. Uh, for those of you watching on Zoom, I'm going to take some questions in a minute. Please do put your questions in the Q and A, uh, and we'll have a look at those in just a minute. But I'm going to start with questions in the room, and what I hope to do is to take uh, three questions and then put them to the panel. Uh, we do have a roving mic, um, so we'll start with the gentleman at the back. Please wait until the mic comes, and then do say who you are, uh, and then ask your question or make a comment. <coughs> well, I, I think my question Concrete replacements out of plastic waste packaging. Um, I'd like to ask the panel whether we're missing the point. In my experience across multiple industries as an investor and a participant, the key question that we need to ask of all these businesses is what is your gross margin? If you don't have a decent gross margin, the business will never make a profit, will be hampered by the overheads it has, and in a high wage economy, will really struggle. If you have a decent gross margin, then you can expand like crazy, make money like bandits, and whatever technology you have will be deployed. I suspect the UK is in the very smart technology, but very low gross margin camp. So my question to the panel is, for UK PLC, what is the right 
gross margin to aspire to as a minimum? And if you don't know the answer, I'll give you a clue. My company, we make a 70% gross margin out of waste. Thank you. Uh, interesting, good. Um, yes, another question right from the back row there. Uh, Stephen Morley, I'm president of the Confederation of British Metal Forming, based in the Midlands. We've got 200 members across the UK. I uh, spent yesterday at the AFRC, so I'm very uh, know about the uh, catapults. And this morning at uh, Imperial College London, uh, discussing an innovative project we're working on. Um, my question to the panel is, uh, very, by the way, a very positive meeting. It's nice to come to a manufacturing meeting when it's positive. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, my question to the panel is, how do we bring all the things together that Will mentioned about, uh, first of all, the government industrial strategy, not what Ed was talking about, the actual top-level industrial strategy. There isn't one. And how we attract youngsters into the, our industry. Thank you. Very good. And we'll take one more question. Um, you want to come down to the front, Hilary, uh, just stay. Keep your hand up, Hilary. <laughs> there you go. The microphone's just coming. Thank you. I'm Hilary Levers from Engineering UK. And actually, just slightly building on that point, I'd be very interested to hear what people um, think is the government's role. And you talked about the enabling role that government has. What role does it have specifically in making sure that we will have the skills needs um, for high value manufacturing and particularly in the environmental sustainability aspect? Fantastic. Um, three questions. So the panel, you can pick up one or more of them. Um, Catherine, I'm going to start with you. <laughs> I'm not sure I do have a good answer, but I'd love to chat to you later. I do remember when I worked at Vauxhall Motors, the MD used to say, I'd love to have the uh, profits that the supermarkets do, um, because you know everything is on a, a wafer thin. And um, it's, it's incredibly hard, especially when you're a large multinational company to persuade your head office if it's not in the UK <coughs> to continue to invest if, if, if the, the figures aren't good. So I think um, there's a number of opportunities that we want, want to talk about and Edwin touched on the government strategy but I, I think there's other things that I could share with you that, that we do in the catapults and it's also um, giving advice, uh, working collaboration with other companies on how to improve your businesses and obviously our expertise is in manufacturing but there's so much that can be done i know in the aerospace sector there's uh, many initiatives sc21 etc where you can actually get together and, and get more business coaching and a lot of universities business schools also help with that but be lovely to talk to you afterwards to hear your approach and good good luck with your project fantastic will um well, turnover is vanity, profit is sanity, <coughs> and cash is queen. Um, and I agree gross margin is important. So is EBITDA and all that other stuff. I think on that one, um, it, it, it's very dependent upon what business you're in. But what I would say is everything is about barriers to entry. It's about creating difference. It's about creating value to your consumer. And increasingly, manufacturers are not manufacturers. They're distributors, brand owners, retailers. So the more vertically integrated you are, the more value you can offer to your customer, the better you understand your customer because you're actually engaging with them and selling with them. And that all supports a stronger gross margin. Um, and in my experience, um, ownership has a lot to do with, with gross margin. If you are really interested in investing in deep engineering, you create value. But that takes time. The Germans are quite good at it. And then that creates barriers to entry, that creates real value that others don't have, and people are prepared to pay for it. If you're too heavily VC-backed and you're too short-term, then you're never going to get to that point. So it, it's... Unfortunately, there isn't a single answer, but I mean, of course, we've got to make a profit or, or we're all scuppered. Um, and for me, coming back to the second question on the industrial strategy and skills, I really think we've got a lack of ambition inside the UK for being creators, makers, innovators. It's simply not cool. 
and that needs that we need to take that seriously. And the one um, element that I think Edmund missed in his great uh, circle of life was grey matter, human capital. And I think that's where we're missing. And that needs to start at primary. It needs to start with parents, teachers, and primary. If you speak to prim primary students, they want to be on Love Island and play football. They don't want to be makers. So, and, and that is not difficult to shift. You know, we, we managed to get everyone to want to bake by creating Bake Off. <laughs> so, you know, it's not so difficult. Um, but it needs to be a cohesive plan. And if we can get ambition and we can redefine what an amazing career that we have, and the world needs solutions. We don't need money shifting from one computer to another. We need to sort real solutions out for the global challenges we face. And that is an exciting career. If we can articulate that, the rest, if the ambition is there, you'll find you can train. That's not so difficult. If people want it, you, you'll deliver the rest. Peter, your thoughts? Um, <clears throat> Yes, well, to, to go to Henick's question, um, it reminded me of a conversation I had with a, a very clever man, actually, called Eddie Davis, um, who, who, who ran Strix, a company which <coughs> some of you might know about, making thermostats on the Isle of Man, and they also made them in China. Now, he didn't want to give me this information, but I worked it out that his gross margin was about 90%. <laughs> and he said, oh, no, because he was from Bolton, in fact, he also owned Bolton Wanderers Football Club. He, he, it was quite hard to find that inf information. It was a private, very, very private company. Now, they did a wonderful job, um, and I'm sure to get that sort of, um, that, that sort of figure it took some doing, and, and it did. It was a brilliant company. Um, I mean, for the sort of companies I'm talking about in my model of the hard tech, I don't really know what their gross, gross margins are. I mean, I, I suppose I start with the idea that um, people should start with some of these ideas that I discussed. Uh, in a sense, if they're, if they're sitting in Britain employing decent numbers of people um, um, and, um, and, and seemingly doing well, so far as you can tell from their figures, which you can't always, um, they must be doing something right, apart from if they're owned by the mafia or something like that, and, uh, in which case all the figures are completely impossible to see. Uh, uh, and what's... I, I mean, I think it's a great question about what are their margins, but I, I suppose I have to take a more simple approach. Um, with the thing about the industrial strategy, um, and again, I've got a slightly jaundiced view, really. I do remember a fantastic study done in Germany um, about 15 years ago by a, a consulting outfit called Agamus, who's disappeared from view, but I, I got to know them, and they did a wonderful study of why some of those German manufacturers were so good. And um, they, they went into it in a very Germanic way in huge depth. And they found out that government, um, government projects, government role, had very, very little to do with it. Certainly government should set the scene, make sure people know about what's going on, put money in where it's required, in, sort out the things about the skills, and perhaps take up Will's idea about defining engineers properly, um, and that's it. But, and get good people to work in the government and, and, um, and promulgate what's good and what's bad. Thank you. Um, Edmund, government view, or your view anyway. Thanks, yeah, I think everything is, is my view, government rather than government view, but uh, yeah, I appreciate I'm, I'm here as, as the policymaker on the panel. Um, in terms of, yeah, Henny's question, I, I, as government we work with companies and we see a lot of information which obviously we can't then comment on. I would say we see a very big range of, of, of gross margins across different sectors. <coughs> in general, the, the high volume manufacturers have got the smaller margins and the high value uh, have got have got larger gross margins, and you know how do you go from how do you keep the volume and, and increase increase the margin, or how do you kind of pick a sector as a company, and it will be a choice for companies, not for government. Um, I think you you know you've either got to be able to sell it for more, or you've got to be able to you know reduce your costs. And the pro government is very focused on the productivity, and and actually you know things like our made smart made smarter program, which is giving companies the, the tools that they need to be able to make more with less is how you have the ability to, to, to change the margin. So again, I'm, I appreciate I'm not telling you something you don't know, but I think that is 
that's recognized by government and we've, we're, you know, we're putting our sort of programs like Made Smarter out there for that reason because it's about you know, you know, the, the productivity challenge and with productivity comes growth, as you said. Um, on industrial strategy, and look, I, 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 I don't, I, I come from the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. If you think of look what uh, Minister Freeman has been saying in, in, in the House in, you know, in recent weeks, um, and he's been asked that question, it is not about whether there is a document that is called an industrial strategy, and it is very much about how is government acting. And if you look at the programmes that we are running, if you look at the, 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 the sectoral sort of focus that we have, you know, the Automotive Council, uh, or the, you know, the aerospace, you know, the, the life sciences, you know, bodies, if you look at the, the, um, the programs that we're running in terms of, you know, the Automotive Transformation Fund or the aerospace or the, the shipbuilding, et cetera, you know, so, so if you look at those where we are actually intervening and then on an industrial side as well with, you know, obviously, you know, challenges with, with, with a number of sort of industry sectors as well, but we know we're very clearly kind of focused and committed to those, you know, energy intensive industry scheme, et cetera, recognizing that the energy sort of importance for those sectors. I think um, it's, it's activity um, that defines, you know, actions, not words, I guess, um, is, is, is what maybe the government position is on that. Um, and then and building on that, you know, specifically on skills, I mean, I think, you know, there's absolutely recognise the challenge, skills are, are, are what unlocks, you know, innovation opportunity, you know, manufacturing productivity, growth, etc. Uh, that's fundamental. It's not a short term fix often in, in these situations. Uh, I think, you know, we do work very closely with the Department for Education, the Department for Work and Pensions, you know, you know, number 10 have very sort of strong focus on, on skills, etc. Uh, if you look at the programmes that have come out in terms of T levels and apprenticeships, no scheme like that will be perfect, especially not when it's introduced, but you have to get, but then, you know, take those, make them better, make them work, um, and then building the, building the, building the reputation, you know, what can government do, what's the enabling role there, uh, you know, uh, I think really selling the value of this, you know, working on, on critical minerals, you know, we're talking about, you know, how do you turn Minecraft into the tool that everybody then will wants to go and do mining, because mining used to be a dirty word, but actually, minerals are what's going to power the, the technological revolution that gets us to net zero. So, you know, how do you actually address, you know, the net, the audience for, you know, the people who will be the, the makers of the future? And I think that is not easy, but that doesn't mean we don't try. Fantastic. Let's take another raft of questions from in the room. There aren't so many online yet, so if you're online, please do that. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, right, let's just start on the inside of the aisle, if, uh, if we can, Bella. Um, yeah, the gentleman with the red tie, just just a bit further forward. Come forward. There you go. On this side. Yeah. I think he needs to put his hand up. Put your hand up. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. Um, John Pierce, I'm Chief Executive for Made in Britain. We're a non-profit organisation representing 2,000 British manufacturers making all sorts of things. Um, the question I've got is for, for all of the panel, really. It's about um, something that I'm really interested in called gap reporting. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if any of the panel have seen any accurate measures on what we're not making yet in the British economy and that we need to make. Uh, and the reason I think that's important is because, of course, uh, if we're focusing on, on hard tech and innovation and high value manufacturing of certain products, um, surely we need to make sure that we're focusing on the things that we actually need to increase the making of in this country rather than just things that are interesting or, or uh, attractive to look at uh, rather than you know making something that's actually necessary and that's not being made at the moment and then the second part of the question is around uh, whether the British the current British manufacturing community uh, has actually got the appetite for making something other than what they make at the moment um, and this this may be a question to all of the manufacturers in the room um, is you know is there a desire to make something other than a bike for example at, at, at Brompton you know could you change the nature of the organization that you run to make something other than a, a folding bike or to make a different kind of bike at a different margin? Um, and again, that, that question is to sort of all of us that are really caring about the growth of British manufacturing and whether we'll be making the things that we need rather than just things that we think are interesting or attractive. Fantastic, well, I'm, I'm sure we can answer that one. Um, yeah, so the gentleman just behind Thanks, uh, Andrew Everett, ERA Foundation. So I think we've got 
two problems. One's short term and one's longer term. We've got a, there's very, various figures say there's like 90, 100,000 or so uh, employee gap in manufacturing in the UK currently. Uh, and then we've also got the situation where we're only seeing 19 or 20 percent of the teacher um, vacancies being filled in physics and design and technology. Mm -hmm. So teachers, as we know, are really critical in encouraging young people into careers, into their career choices, and also we've got a, a current uh, massive gap in employment. So uh, I'd like to know what the panel's thoughts are on practical solutions to solve those short and longer term uh, problems. Fantastic. And as a third question, can we go to the lady at the <coughs> back, uh, Bella, uh, on this side? Yeah, and then just, sorry, just keep your hand up so Bella can get to you. There you go. Thank you. Uh, Jenny Holloway, CEO of a company called Fashion Enter. I just wanted to pick up about the importance of women in engineering today. So we, our organisation uh, has got factories in Leicester, uh, Wales, and also in London. And after Brexit, we had horrendous um, issues with regards to skills. So taking Tim's point, we were creative. We set up um, an academy. We wrote qualifications because they weren't fit for purpose intended. And now we find we're having a downturn. We've looked at funding, and it's, why is it so complicated? Now, we're an SME, we're busy, and yet when you go for funding, when you're looking for support, it is very laborious. And I also find that the same old companies seem to get the funding. And sometimes we don't need millions, but we need to invest into those raw skills for the future, otherwise we're never going to get women into engineering. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, we're going to go in the opposite order, I think, this time. So, Edmund, I'm going to start with you. Okay. Thank you. Um, again, three great questions and all, all really important. Um, John, in terms of uh, Made in Britain and sort of the, the, the question around gap reporting, um, I'm not going to list off reports. The Institute for Manufacturing has done some interesting work on this. Again, we'll, we'll probably find a way to kind of circulate links or something afterwards if, if helpful. Um, I think in terms of uh, looking at the, the whole supply chain, it's not just about, you know, what are the gaps in end products, but what are the what are the, the widgets or the, the bits on the way that, that get you get you there? And I think there's some some really good opportunities there too. In terms of government sort of laying out where um, where sectors are going, I think that is a, a really important role for government in, in terms of our uh, you know recent work on that. In terms of our critical minerals intelligence centre <coughs> that we launched last year, we, we we started a series of sectoral studies. The first one was on batteries and kind of looking at. What, what are the parts? What are the parts that go into those? What do we need? Where's the, what's the demand? Where's the future? So the idea is to sort of signal where there is a case for investment. Um, uh, and I think uh, we see, you know, we've seen the catapults have done, you know, or you know, uh, studies around wind turbines and you know other of those kind of sectors that we know we've kind of identified in the ten point plan, for example. Uh, but I think there's more we can do on that. And again, we're yeah, looking at some of those sectors, and there is there's more to follow on that. Um, I think in terms of the skills shortage, um, yeah, I think uh, I, I think we're talking a lot to DFE. I'm not going to come up <coughs> now with a list of 10 great practical solutions that we could just do because they've probably already been done. I hope, but if anybody has ideas, I will be all ears for this bit because I, I, I'd, re I'd really like to take those back because it is really important. Um, importance of women engineering, absolutely uh, second that. And again, as government, we are very conscious that you know our manufacturing sort of boards, the boards of our Made Smarter Commission, etc. We are very committed to making sure that when we appoint people to those boards, we are representing the diversity um, that we think should be represented, that represents the whole population and not just sort of the male pale and stale that we sometimes get when we sort of first draw up a shortlist. And I include myself in that. Um, uh, funding is complicated, uh, government funding. Uh, we are doing things to make it simpler. Uh, Innovate UKs have just recently sort of beta tested and they're soon fully launching uh, a sort of a, a program finder, which is excellent. And I think, uh, again, we will definitely make sure that, that gets out there. We are due to publish quite soon our manufacturing investment prospectus, which is meant to be a one-stop shop. It will be a PDF, but it will have links in it so that you can read through, find the bits that are relevant to you, and go straight to the relevant pages. And that's definitely something that we want to get out there. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, Peter? Um, yes. Well, to, to, answer, to, to have a go at John's point about the gap reporting, I mean, well, it just seems to me, um, if you've got somebody making bikes, it'd be ludicrous, I'll have to ask him what he thinks, to get him to start making electric cookers or something else that you fancy doing. I mean, 
Uh, I don't think the, the record of setting up doing something in a big way, completely from nothing, um, just because you think it's a good idea, we, there's a gap in what, what we do in Britain. I don't think it's a very good idea. Um, British Vault is, is one example. So um, I have to ask what Will thinks, but anyway, that's sort, sort of sorted that one out. And then on the issue of, um, of employees and getting more people interested in all this, well, made here now is, is a sort of modest step in this direction. The idea is to, is to publicize what is a good companies, what, uh, who's, who's doing well, and we, we don't have a lot, lot of money, so we don't, uh, it's not it's a, a huge operation, but that's the sort of thing, publicity. Now, if anyone's really interested in this, um, and Will can be the convener of this, because he's obviously good at going around and knocking on people's doors, go a lot further than getting this engineering uh, definition sorted out. Go around getting, uh, shall we say, a million pounds uh, off each of the big employers of engineers and um, manufacturers in the United Kingdom. Get a, get a, a slush fund of 10 or 15 million pounds organize some TV advertising uh, or, or internet, whatever makes most sense, and do it in a really clever way along the lines of something some years ago that was done for teachers in Britain under a Labour government, got te uh, a big um, campaign. You went into cinemas and you saw an advert about te why teachers were good, and that did have an effect, actually. Um, so put serious amounts of money. He, he can organise the uh, getting <laughs> getting the funds together. He'll have to have a bit of time off from his job. D Jenny's point. I mean, you ought to be getting loads of money from uh, BEIS or whoever for your uh, great work in organising um, these 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 training centres. I mean, wh why you don't? It's it's a it's a scandal. I'd say. Wonderful. Will, what are you going to do? <laughs> well, I had a chair who was forever telling us that we should be making folding everything um, and that we should be on to the next folding wheelchair, <laughs> folding pushchair, folding whatever. Folding should be our thing. All of which I sort of agreed with once we'd extracted the full value from the folding bicycle. Mm. And I think... We're about a tenth of the way there, about 100 million turnover. We've got about a billion. If you look at the world, where they live, how they move, what's happening on the macro economy, once we've rinsed that, then we'll think about other things. But you've got to really remain focused and be very good at what you do and do it on a global scale. Having said that, I think government does have a role, and it's a shame we're not part of Europe because it's a bit easier when you do it with everyone else, but green metal really, we touched on it earlier, that is so important because there's so much chat about being green. I was at the uh, COP26 up in, in, in Glasgow and there was a chap from the Scottish Rail telling everybody how wonderful it was and how green they were and how they'd got to net zero. And I said, oh, that's very interesting. So what about your, your rolling stock? What about your rail? Where the hell are you getting your green stock? Oh, no, we don't include that. We're only doing stage one and stage two or whatever it was. So he wasn't actually telling the whole truth. And we're, you know, we're a service economy, more or less, in the UK. So we're happily you know, plugging our computers into green energy. But, but we're missing a trick. We're consuming lots of steel. And we've got to get that sorted. And we ought to do it inside Europe. The same with British Vault is the very one I was thinking of. Someone needs to take that seriously. We need lithium iron. And obviously, silicon um, and chips uh, need de dealing with. But I mean, there are some areas of our industry needs to be dealt with by government. And they've got to just just pile some money and get on with it. It's this sort of half assed sort of dipping your toe in, politically incorrect. You just do it properly and do it properly, or don't do it at all. But sort of, sort of death by a thousand cuts doesn't seem to be really working. Anyway, employee gap. Th there is actually, um, I mean, you need to inspire. You know, it, it, coming back to women, inspire, inspire, inspire. Teachers, inspire. Um, employees inspire women. Um, that, that is a big missing piece, and the government could help, and so should our industry, big time. But we have 800 staff. We give them all a day off to volunteer. We are involved in something called Inspiring the Future, where our staff go into schools 
and actually deliver class. It's way more interesting than the boring old teacher that the students have had forever. And, you know, if you're a heart surgeon, you go into a school and you deliver a class, they can say, what well, what's it really like to chop someone in half? And how much do you actually earn? And when did you last get spurted in the eye with blood? You know, that's really exciting. Um, and, and we've got, in engineering, as I've just heard whispering into my ear from Peter, two and a half million engineers. Ma manufacturing. Total manufacturing. Includes. Yeah, but you, you but you need to take our manufacturing, our staff at all levels go into schools to, 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 to educate. So we could leverage our engineering base to engage with schools and universities way, way more. And that would support some of the, the short-term gap. And then, of course, it, it, we need to inspire very finely women. Um, we are... Um, I mean, I've got three sisters and three daughters, so I'm a quite a hardcore feminist. But I'm also very, very commercial. And, and this is the absolute minority. But if your business is for middle-aged white men, I'm not that bothered if all the people in the board and all the people in the company are middle-aged white men, because that's your market. But the world, money is not spent by middle-aged white men. It's mostly spent by women. The decision-making for the car, for the important things that you buy in the house. So most of the things that are made, designed, and delivered by men are bought by women. So anybody who is in business needs to get more women into their organization to understand their customer. And if we're not doing that, we're not going to be competitive, we're not going to innovate in the right way, and we're going to miss out. But, you know... We've nurtured and developed quite a few female engineers in various different parts of our business, and then they get nicked at a very high premium that we can't afford, because if we pay that premium, it knocks out our entire you know, pay, you know, payment structure in the organization, because there simply are not enough women in the marketplace. Never mind enough employees, but there aren't enough women. So uh, there's a huge opportunity there. Again, but the parents haven't got a clue. Let them know that if their child goes into engineering, they will be absolutely coining it. They will, but it's not clear. And they'll be straight in and they'll become the youngest director at 32 because they need to get a woman on the board. So no, I'm telling my daughters this all day long. Anyway. <laughs> Catherine. <laughs> Thank you. I, I will actually just touch on an earlier question about industrial strategy because Edmund has to I'll be very careful sometimes what you say, and I, 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 it is still on the name of the department, and I fundamentally think it is a good thing, and actually I do think it is still alive and kicking, just because ministers don't want to use the word, that's fine, that's their political um, you know, way they have to speak, but for me, getting around a table, the collaboration, such as the Automotive Council, which has been going for several years, and as Edmund said, if a lot of industry people say the same thing, then things they get listened to, but it has to be consistent. Um, and that's so true on skills as well. And I've sat around the table at, at some of these growth partnerships, and I believe there is one on fashion. If there isn't, maybe we should talk about setting one up. Um, but on skills particularly, it's interesting now in the role I have, I sit and listen to lots of different parts of the manufacturing sector, and on skills it's often the same thing. So also going back to the question about um, Made in Britain, um, one of the things we do in the Catapult across our seven centres is the foresighting, which I touched on earlier. Um, I'd be happy to have a chat with you about that, because we sometimes don't know what we don't know. But how do we find out by going to meetings like this, by meeting others and learning from other sectors? I find it fascinating when automotive engineers speak to nuclear engineers, speak to um, also chemists and other parts of our sector who learn about different techniques and, and, and we, need to, we need to share that more. On the teacher's shortage, I mean, hats off to Engineering UK, by the way, for what you do. And the Royal Academy as well have done a lot. You know, they do these engineering initiatives where we were all asked to get involved in. You know, maybe when they next come and ask us to get involved, let's get involved. I'm happy to do whatever I can to mobilise forces on that. Um, the shortage of teachers, my brother-in-law and sister-in-law are both teachers in design technology and they're not enjoying their jobs at the moment um, but there's lots of pressures on the teaching sector and we do need to make it um, you know we need to help them um, further their careers and one other way 
of encouraging younger people as well is to also get the teachers into the schools. It's not just getting the kids in. Sorry, the teachers into industry. Yeah. Come, come, get the teachers to, to go around the factories, and then they know, and then they can help share that with the with the um, students. So, uh, in terms of complication of accessing funding, I agree, and this is something, as Edmund said, the government to do. I forgot what you called it, a data hub. Um, to explain that it is complicated, we all know that, and it needs to improve. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, we're very close to the end of our time. What I'm going to ask is for each of the panel to give some short reflections on how we could make things better from where we are, um, taking account the different points that have been made and the different things that have been raised. Um, if you haven't had a chance to ask a question, uh, if you're in the room, um, then there will be another chance uh, after dinner. But um, let's just get some final reflections from the panel. Peter. Um, <clears throat> well, p perhaps I could just leave you with one reflection, which um, I think has, something to, has some link or some resonance with everything we've been talking about. Um, I, I just want to relay on something that somebody told me a long time ago. This is Kuma Bhattacharya, mm. who some of you will remember uh, a really inspiring man who uh, ran and set up the Warwick Manufacturing Group uh, d died a few years ago now. Um, I once asked him, how do you become a successful manufacturer in Britain? What are the ingredients? And he gave three things, which I think is worth dwelling on, and I haven't come across anything better than this, as these three things. Um, the first thing he said is that you don't need to invent technology, you need to be able to transfer it. You need to be able to use it. Mm. The second thing is you adopt a global mindset. And by that he means you don't necessarily have to sell everywhere all around the world, but you have to understand a bit about what your competitors are doing, what is good and bad about other things in your industry, so you know about it and you're mindful of it on a global scale. And the third thing, sounds dead simple, but it's not, of course, is recruit good people and retain them. So that's it. Fantastic. Very straightforward. Mm. Uh, Will? Um, I'm trying to think if I can sort of do any better than that. I'm struggling with my brain twigging along. Um, yeah, we... I think something... I, I'm just going to keep coming back to a, a singular theme, which is inspiration. And we're trying to recruit good people into our organization. <coughs> and I would say, I'm making this up, but it's not far from the truth. 70%, 80% of our staff join us because of what we're trying to do in the world. We're trying to make the world a bit better. We're trying to make it a bit greener. We're trying to make cities a better place to live and people healthier and happier. So purpose, solving climate change, improving the environment, biodiversity, matter immensely to the generation, the younger generation coming through now. And if they mean a lot to the generation today, they're going to mean even more to the generation coming behind them because they will see more fires, more famines, more droughts, more floods. So the pressing need of solving the world's problems is absolutely front and centre. So if you can leverage that, that real important priority for the world and articulate that and explain to people who are at school that if they study these subjects, they can help solve some of the world's problems. That's very meaningful to the generations coming along. And if we can articulate that, and inspire them and explain to them how this study of physics, maths, chemistry can contribute to solving the world's problems, I think that will be a big step forward. But we, we've got to make it people feel proud, and we've got to rise it up like you have with doctors and other acronyms. Mm. And that engineering thing is a long little pebble that as an industry and a sector we failed to address, and, and it forms part of the solution. Catherine. I think, I'll, I'll be very quick, I think the main thing is to lift the lid, get the case studies out there, get the stories out there that can do the inspiration, encourage collaboration whatever way we can, whether it's through 
a buzzword of industrial strategy or something else under some other initiative, um, get behind initiatives and support, but you know, and get the stories out there that the UK is still good at the design and then the manufacture, and I'm, I'm dedicating my life to doing that. Fantastic. Edmund, last word. Yeah, again, agree, agree with all the points that have been made on a sort of a technical point, and then going back to the enabling environment, things around sort of scope three emissions or, you know, you know carbon border adjustment sort of mechanisms, uh, I, I think uh, was one thing that was sort of picked up from before. But again, more broadly, yeah, it's about being really clear about, as the UK, what we need, the missions that we're focused on, and that whatever those missions are, and they are, you know, I think as government, we're fairly clear that, you know, net zero and, and levelling up, et cetera, these, these big agendas, then th they are either enabled by or will be improved by having a thriving manufacturing sector. And I think that's something that we can't repeat too many times or have more good examples of or work more closely with, with industry and, and academia to sort of build those, build those examples and build a case. And that's what we will continue to do. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, well, listen, we've come to the end of our time. I want to thank again our fantastic speakers, Peter, Will, Catherine and Edmund, <coughs> and also thank the three organisations who sponsored us this evening, the ERA Foundation, Royal Academy of Engineering and Stirling Media. Thank you to all of you for coming along as well. You will receive uh, an email with a feedback survey after this, so please do fill that in. Um, and a recording of the event will be on our website tomorrow. Um, Skills is one of the things that came up during the conversation, and the next event being organised by the Foundation is on the 22nd of February here in the Royal Society, uh, and it's, it's titled, How Can Schools and Colleges Prepare Young People for a Technological Life and Help Tackle the Technical Skills Gap? So I hope that some of you will come back in a month's time and we can dive into that particular aspect of this conversation in a bit more depth. Um, details of that event's on our website. You can register now. Um, for those of you joining online, thank you very much, and we're going to say goodbye. Um, for those of you in the room, there's going to be a drink in the room behind you. Um, there's dinner at 8 o'clock, and for any of you who didn't sign up for dinner, we've unfortunately had a couple of people who haven't been able to come this evening. So if you'd like to stay for dinner and you haven't signed up, there will be food for you. So <laughs> please don't let it go to waste, and please stay. But for, for now, uh, to the panel, thank you very much again. Two dinners.